Welcome to the Alain Guillot Podcast, where we speak about personal development and entrepreneurship. This is episode 127. Today, we are having a conversation with Lex Lakoski. Now, Lex, he's a world traveler. He has traveled to 82 countries and wrote a book called Passport Forward, moving from regrets and routine to freedom, passion, and an adventure. Now, let's listen to the conversation. Lex Lakoski, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you very much, Alain. It's very nice to be here. So, listen, Lex, I'm reading your book, Passport Forward, which is a book that talks about your travel. You were feeling stuck in your cubicle and through a series of decisions and events, you started traveling. Now, I used to be a financial advisor about 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. And when I used to see couples or single people or whatever, I would ask them about their objective, the financial objectives. And about 80% of them used to say, oh, one day I would like to travel. In addition to that, at one time also I used to do internet dating. And I used to go through all these profiles and about 60 or 70 percent of the girls, they say that they would like to meet a man who would like to travel. Yet, Lex, what frustrates me is that no one does it. No one really <laughs> takes their passport, jumps into an airplane and travels. And those who do travel, they always go to the same freaking hotel <laughs> resort. I mean, a Sheraton hotel in Bahamas or in Cuba or whatever, they are always the same. They don't change. They are always the same uh, lobby center, the same internal room, the same rooms. Nothing changed except the stamp that you get in the passport. So people, they say, oh, I'm going to Cuba, which is the favorite destination of people in Montreal or in Canada because it's cheaper. But they stay in the resort. They never go anywhere. So I wanted to pick your brains in regards to alternative ways to travel. All right. Well, uh, that's, that's interesting you say that because I, I get that all the time. I, I just did a survey recently with all my readers and, and uh, the general public. I, I got over uh, close to 100 responses. And I asked people if they could if they weren't worried about money or time, where would they go? Like which country would they go to visit? And then I said, okay, now knowing that we don't have infinite time and money, what's getting in your way? And the, you know, the obstacles and they, the obstacles were always either time, like vacation schedule or money, meaning they didn't have enough money to go do it. Or it was, so, they, they wanted to go to Australia from America, for example, and it was going to be way too difficult to get over there and back, you know, with their regular schedule. And so, but, but the, the bulk of the, where people wanted to go it was, you know, the predictable, you know, from America, it was the predictable, I want to go to France, I want to go to Germany, I want to go to Italy, I want to go to Spain. Uh, and then, of course, there were people that, that said, okay, I want to go to Croatia, or I want to go to, um, you know, um, Uruguay, or something unusual, but you don't usually see that. And the, uh, you know, I, I will say that for some people, just going to Jamaica or to the Bahamas or something is, is an adventure. And for them, you know, based on where they are in life and what their perceived risk reward uh, setup is, you know, some people don't want to go to like we just my girlfriend and I just got back from Belize and we went to Colombia in June. And those places, a lot of people would never want to go there because they're afraid. And so, you know, I, I get that. And, uh, you know, for them, it's much easier for them to go to the Bahamas or something safe. Um, you know, for me, that's that's too safe. It's too boring. There's nothing against those places. But I like a little bit of uh, I like to go where I don't see a Starbucks. I like to go where I don't see a whole lot of other people doing the exact same thing that they're doing here. I'm in Louisville, Kentucky. So I, I choose to go where, you know, where it's a little different. But that's just me. For some people, they don't have that. They don't have that uh, built in security or the built in adventure. And for them, you know, heck, uh, the Bahamas or, or uh, you know, something simple like, you know, going to, to London or going to France is very safe and very easy to do. So I, I understand that part, too. Yeah, you just mentioned something that uh, triggers my memory. Uh, about three years ago, I went to Playa del Carmen in Mexico. Right. And there you have basically two cities, the city for the local and the city for the tourists. <laughs> And the city for the tourists is 
practically you didn't step out of the United States <laughs> at all because it's Starbucks, uh, what is it, Planet Hollywood, <laughs> Walmart, Costco, you know, you might as well be in downtown whatever major city there is in, in the United States. It's, it, there's no different. And the same, uh, what is it, spring break, uh, vibe, you really feel you are in the States. You didn't travel. Uh, you might as well just go to another city in the States. It would be cheaper. Well, it's funny you say that. Uh, we, we need to compare notes some other time. But the, I think you and I were in Playa del Carmen uh, at the same time. And I, I had the same experience. My girlfriend and I were staying with some friends, uh, some other couples in, a, in an all-inclusive resort. And, you know, I, it's not my normal gig, but I wanted to hang out with my best friends from childhood. And, um, but, you know, we, we stayed in the, we stayed in the, uh, you know, the, the confines of the place. Generally, we went on a bike ride, but, you know, if you wanted to go see anything, you had to get in the car and drive 45 minutes to an hour to go see where the, uh, you know, where the real people live. Right. Okay. So, um, Lex, how about we get started by you telling us how did it all got started? I know that you were in your cubicle, you have a nice life. So tell us a little bit about your background, who were you, and then what was the series of events that led you to start using your passport? Okay, great. So, um, you know, I, I have to, it, it would be really hard to say when, but I grew up in a, in a family that was always uh, adventurous and travels. We traveled a lot. So when I was in seventh grade, we drove from Louisville, Kentucky, all the way up through uh, Mount Rushmore over to, um, you know, Yosemite and down through California and down into Mexico and then back through the Grand Canyon, et cetera. And so by the time I was in eighth grade, I had already seen, you know, half of America. And then uh, I, I spent a, a little bit of time in Ireland with a, a buddy of mine that I'd met. Uh, when I was in college, and then I proposed to my my fiance at the time, or my girlfriend at the time, in Ecuador, straddling the equator in mitad del mundo. Uh, that's right, you speak Spanish, so that means the middle, the middle of the half of the world. And uh, and so by the time I, you know, the the reason my girlfriend at the time was, uh, you know, she thought it was pretty interesting because I'd already been to like 14 countries because I had spent a semester studying at uh, uh, two semesters studying at the University of Madrid while I was at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. So um, the, the travel bug goes way, way back. But uh, the, the, the part you're referring to, and, and, I'm, and I touch on it in my book, um, where I was, uh, the, the chapter's called, you know, uh, Successful But Restless, I think it was. Successful But Restless. I was making a lot of money. I was married. I had a nice house. And this is in Phoenix at the time. And I was making more money than anybody I knew. But there was just something that just wasn't – there was like this unfulfilled part. And, you know, eventually I realized that that it was – you know, I really wanted to go see what the world had before I got too old or my body didn't, you know, work right. And I wanted to go see the bigger picture. So I set myself up to do that financially. And, um, you know, I went and lived at a Zen monastery for uh, 16 months and, uh, you know, figured out what exactly I wanted and who I was. And then in uh, 2006 and 2007, I traveled around the world nonstop for 16 months. And then I came home for three uh, three years and uh, bought another house and renovated it and sold it and then traveled around the world for another 16 months. So uh, it's kind of hard to say exactly where it started, but there was a part of me that always knew that I wanted to go do that. And I didn't want to just settle for the, you know, the standard life that everyone wants to live, which is bust your butt at work save money. And then one day, hopefully you'll be able to play golf or go see, you know, the Grand Canyon or rent an RV or something. But very few people actually do that anymore. Yeah, as you just mentioned, very few people do that. Most people stay in their hometown and maybe they will go to another city nearby or something that they are familiar with. If you had to guess, I, I, I ask you this because I have I feel it a bit myself. What is it that makes you restless? That, you know, you are in one place and you are wishing you could be in another one. What was, if you could describe it, what is that feeling? Oh, wow, that's a great question. Um, the, when, I'm, when I'm traveling, uh, you know, I've now been, I think this, uh, we got back from Belize uh, three weeks ago. That was my 82nd country. And when I'm traveling and I'm in a, a, a fun country that I call fun, meaning there's something to do, there's adventure every day is an adventure, meaning I'm not, 
I'm not staying in the same place generally. We, you know, I move every couple of days. So I, I see new neighborhoods. I see new restaurants. I see new bars. I see new people. And when I was traveling nonstop for 16 months at a time, I was able to see all kinds of things. So I was never bored. I was never, I was, I was kind of always looking and learning and, and adventuring and meeting new people. So there's always this, uh, you know, I don't get bored easily because I'm always doing something I think that's important or something that's interesting. But the, uh, you know, feeling like there was something more or getting restless was the traveling, the adventure traveling that I like to do. I never feel like, oh, there's something else I should be doing. It's like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm exploring. I'm adventuring. I'm seeing something new every single day. I have to figure out where I'm going to sleep, what I'm going to eat. And um, I walk out the door every night. You know, sometimes I go right, sometimes I go left. And then I always go a different way coming home and I always see something new. And it's like it's impossible to get bored there because uh, I'm not doing this, the same thing. So, um, you know, those those five star all inclusive places that I stayed in uh, Playa del Carmen or Cozumel down in Mexico, they're great. But to me, that's just you know, I may as well be sitting on the couch, except that, you know, there's a beach and it's sunny and I could drink free beer or something. <laughs> okay, yes. Um, but, you know, it's just that I see it uh, here all the time. People saying, I want to travel, I want to go away. And what is it? Is it they always claim that it's sort of lack of money or lack of time. But would you, would you say that it's fear, fear of the unknown, fear of, I don't know, no being able to go to the local Starbucks that they know the, you know, their, their menu or what is it that allow you to take wings and go away and 99% of the people to stay home and, and see all these traveling uh, documentaries and wish they would be there, but never actually taking the jump to, to go in there. Well, that's, uh, unfortunately, I think part of the reason that people uh, are resistant to going to places like Colombia is because, you know, of course, back in back in the day, back when the cartels were there and the executions and the bombings and all, you know, that that was bad. It was one of the most dangerous countries in the world. But people still, because they watch way too much TV and they watch way too much news, they, they they're sensationalized with violence, with danger, with the world is a dangerous place. And they're afraid to go out there and and see you know see the off the beaten track. So I don't I don't watch a whole lot of TV. I, I I definitely don't watch the news. You know I read it on the web or read it on my phone, but I only read selected venues. I don't I don't buy into the the, the mainstream media stuff. So I don't have that built in fear that the world's a dangerous place. And by going so many different times by traveling, I've gotten over the fear that it's a dangerous place. And so if I go on another trip. It may take me a day or two to figure out, OK, these people are good. These people are bad. This is going to be a, a street I don't walk down or whatever. But I'm not afraid like that. So if some people came to me and said, hey, Lex, I want to go see Romania. I'm like, let's go do it. I'll show you that it's that, you know, Romania is not a dangerous place, but no one ever wants to go to Romania from America. But if I took you to Romania for a week, you would be you would come home and you would you would brag about it for weeks or months. It would be the coolest thing you'd ever done, probably. But no one wants to do it because they don't know what to do. So it's just a matter of booking a ticket, getting on the plane and figuring out how to do it without being afraid that everything's going to fall apart. So I don't know if that answered your question, but, you know, the everybody thinks, oh, I'll just go do the simple thing. And instead of doing the fun thing and uh, they get over there and it's like, oh, the, there's some really cool churches here and. And, and Spain or the, the culture is really cool, but they don't they don't go outside of the cocoon and do what they really, you know, what, what you know, they don't really dig into the local neighborhoods and stuff. So according to your book, you build this funnel in which you were saying no to things that will prevent you to uh, to traveling. And then you were saying yes to the things that will allow you to go farther away with your goal. And you did all these trips. But Let's say a, a regular person who has a job and maybe he doesn't want to abandon his lifestyle, yet he would like to, you know, just get out of the city and discover a little bit of the world. What would be kind of like a series of steps that that person could do just to start exploring? Let's say beginner level, I want to get out of my city. All right. Well, getting out of your city, if you're just going to stay local, you know, stay in your country, then the 
you know, that's, that's always a good step. You would, what I would suggest is you've got to, instead of just saying one of these days, I want to do this, or one of these days I want to go see that, it's buy a ticket, buy a buy a plane ticket or a bus ticket or something and say, six months from now, I'm going to go see whatever city I'm going to go see and or whatever country and buy the ticket. And don't don't worry about how you're going to do it or what you're going to do when you're there. Just buy the round trip ticket for two weeks or whatever. And then tell people, hey, I bought a ticket for Romania or I bought a ticket for wherever, even if it's domestic. But I bought a ticket and I'm going to go do this. And everything between now and then that doesn't uh, help me get closer to getting on that airplane or on that bus, I'm not going to do it or train, you know, where, depending upon where you are in the world. So the funnel that I did was before I bought a ticket to go to India um, in two, 2007. I was going to fly from uh, Louisville, Kentucky to New Delhi, uh, not direct, but, you know, about 15 stops later, it felt like. So everything that did not help me get on that plane I said, no, thank you, you know, for the most part, you know, so I, I cut out all the expenses. I stopped buying things for my my home or, you know, any little knickknacks that I didn't need because I was going to have to box up most of the stuff because I was going to go travel for a long time. But anything that, I, that did not help me get closer to my goal, I said, no, thank you or not right now. And so I cut expenses. I, I simplified my life. I simplified my relationships, et cetera. Um, you know, that was for a bigger, a bigger trip, but for a, a, a smaller trip, you know, for example, in Belize, you know, it's like we bought our tickets and um, we told everybody we were going and everything that we did, you know, from that day until the time we got on the plane was building up for that. So I would start there, you know, the funnel, if you can envision the funnel, you know, you, you've got to get on the plane, which is at the bottom of the funnel or the train or the car or whatever you're doing. But the bottom of the funnel is the day that you get on that plane. And you've got a bunch of stuff that has to go through that funnel before you get on that, uh, you know, take your trip. Everything that doesn't fit in that funnel, let it go, you know, make a note of it or just say, no, thank you. But you have to get everything through that funnel so you can get on the plane. So make a list of everything that's in that funnel that you need to handle. And either what I did was I either deleted it or I delegated it or I did it. Those were the three D's. I did it. I delegated or I deleted uh, so that I could get everything through my funnel so I could get on that plane. Okay, so one of the things that frustrates me when when I was a financial advisor and we were having this conversation is that the same person who used to tell me one day I would like to go to X place and travel or whatever, but I cannot afford it. Okay, so they were telling me this financial thing because that was my job, a financial advisor. Yet, I so it seems like a priority or maybe a nice thing to say but then I look in the garage and I see this expensive new car <laughs> changing cars every four years or so the latest SUV vehicle or brand name car I mean it seems like having in, in North America having a, 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 a brand name car is a symbol of a status something that you have to show to your friends and family and whatever to show that you are successful in life so it seems that this is a bigger priority in in uh in people's life than actually putting uh, i don't know just 50 dollars per week or two for months to get that one airplane ticket to somewhere so this is this is one of the biggest frustration that people say i would like to travel but the actions don't don't show it they really either fall victims of the advertiser or society and yeah the travel budget never gets funded that's uh i'd be interested in finding out you know if you if you did when you were doing your financial advisor role did you actually ask people hey show me track your track your expenses for a month and then show me what your expenses are you have to be honest uh, you know it has to be the honor system but how many times did they go out and spend four dollars at starbucks or how many times did they eat out or how many times a day you know, how, how much was their, their SUV car payment and how much was the insurance for that expensive SUV and all the things that went into it? It's like, well, you know, here's here's a here's a way you can take a trip every year. You know, would you like to do that? Yeah. OK, so trade in the SUV and get a, you know, get a four door sedan. And and uh, and uh, when people say, hey, what happened to your SUV? Say, I'm, I'm going to Romania or I'm going to Egypt. I'm going to go see the pyramids or I'm going to Australia to. Uh, you know, you don't want to go there now because it's on fire. But, uh, you you know, I want to go to Australia and, and swim at the Barrier Reef or go swimming with the, 
you know, uh, with the sharks or whatever, or whatever you want to do. It's like, you know, you, you can do that if you're not throwing money out the window. Right. Okay. Another thing that happens is people have this impression, uh, impression that to travel, you have to have lots of money. And I know that you travel with a small budget. So can you share with us a little bit of how can you travel and you don't have to be a, a millionaire to stay in a five-star resort? How, how, how do people like you do it? That, that's a good question. Some of the places that I went to, don't even have five-star resorts. They don't even have four-star resorts. They don't even have three-star resorts. You know, some of my favorite places in the world, you know, they don't even have stars. You know, you go in, you know, like if I'm in the Himalayas of northern India where I was trekking for four different, you know, summers, you know, you stay with uh, families in their, in, a, in a spare bedroom and you pay them $6 a night and they, they have a mattress that you sleep on the floor and you bring your own pillow or whatever and they make you breakfast, they make you dinner, and then you head out for, you know, six or ten dollars a night. And, you know, it's not for everybody, but there's no stars there. There's there's not even electricity. So um, the when like, for example, when my girlfriend and I just got back from Belize, we, we kind of splurged. We, we went above and beyond our normal our, our normal budget because she was getting ready to start a new job and all kinds of stuff. So we had we were kind of celebrating. But even then, um, we were only spending uh, $80 a night between us for a really nice, uh, no, I actually, no, it was a little bit more than that. It was $150 a night U S for a, a really nice room, uh, with a pool and all that stuff. But normally we don't stay in that kind of a level because we don't generally stay in our hotel room. We go in there to sleep and to get ready to go out. But the most of the time we're out doing something or climbing a mountain or so a lot of people say, Oh, I, I've got to have a, a four star resort or a five star resort. But then they end up, in my opinion, you end up meeting the same people you would meet if you went into a Starbucks. And again, I'm not bashing Starbucks uh, or the life of uh, people that have money, but I guarantee you, you would probably end up meeting some more interesting characters by staying at the two and three star places than you would at the uh, four and five stars. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying, hey, stay at a place with bed bugs or leaky faucets. I'm saying, you know, a, a two and three star in most cases has a clean room. And uh, you're going to get you're going to get by for a third of the price or a fourth of the price. And you're not even going to notice, you know, anything because you're going to be out seeing the world instead of sitting in your hotel room watching the flat screen. <laughs> okay, so let's take your trip to Belize as an example. Okay, so now I'm in Montreal and I just heard you talk about Belize. So I said, wow, I'm going to just check out Belize. I open my browser here and all I get is, well, is the advertisement from the five-star hotels because those are the ones who pay to <laughs> be in the top ranking. So I don't know any better. If Assuming you were in my position and you didn't know any better, what would be the next step if I wanted to go to Belize and, Belize and discover the country instead of just staying in the Hilton or Sheraton Hotel and, and you know, just stay there? Yeah, that's... That's great. So um, I personally don't like to uh, Google for, you know, for example, I wouldn't Google cheap, cheap hotels in Belize because it's going to be either TripAdvisor or uh, nothing against TripAdvisor or any of these other f fine institutions. But I like to find the blogs of people that have been there before, like myself, or there's a guy named Nomadic Matt who's traveled a lot as well. Uh, he just wrote a book recently that came out. It was pretty good. Um, and I would, I would find people that have already been there that are just normal people, not, uh, um, not institutions like TripAdvisor or booking.com or whatever. And I would find people that have been there that can, exp that can tell you what you want to do, where you want to stay for different price ranges. So the, um, that's what we did before we went to Belize and we got some recommendations about where to stay on the different islands or which islands to go to, which where to stay on the different islands. And we, you know, we use that as a reference point. So the other thing is, it's crazy, because, but if you ask somebody that's already been there, that if you find somebody on a blog or a website that uh, has actually been to Belize or Colombia or whatever, and you email them, they will generally respond because they want to share what they've done and say, oh, you know, don't waste your time going to this city, go to this city, or don't waste your time going to those ruins, go to these ruins. Um, and if someone emailed me and said, hey, I'm thinking about going to Romania or I'm going to Poland or I'm going to Croatia, you know, I'd be like, heck, yeah, I'll help you. You know, you know, it's like 
So people generally, um, people that, that do this type of travel, if they're nice, they'll they'll respond to the email and help you a little bit and say, hey, here's where I stayed. It might not be where you're going to stay, but these are the kind of places that you could stay. And um, so I would I would do the research if you're tra- if you're trying to travel um, on the you know on not on the cheap. I don't travel on the cheap, but I travel uh, sensibly. I would do some research and don't just take what TripAdvisor or Booking.com or any of these other institutions tell you. Nothing against them, but I would find the people that have actually been there, the human beings. And there's more than oh my gosh, there's so many people, the expatriates that are living there now, the people that have been there repeatedly that can tell you where to go, where to eat, and um, it's not, you know, five-star. Right. Okay. So right now it's winter here in Montreal. My thermometer says it's minus 17 centigrade. I don't know how much <laughs> it's in Fahrenheit, but it's, it's very cold. And I feel seduced by your idea of going to Belize. So first step is I will buy an airplane ticket. And then the second step will be to do the research and, and look for blogs that will suggest for me where to go. And then after that, then I will book a, a hotel or, or a hostel or Airbnb. Uh, is that is that the plan? That's that's the good plan. That's what we did. We um, we my girlfriend and I booked a flight from Louisville, Kentucky to Belize City. Um, that was the first step. And then we started backfilling with, OK, we're going to need to go. Let's go to this island, which we started off and uh, it's called Ambergris. Um, it's a it's an island right off of the sit uh, of the main uh, the main city, and then we went to Key Calker, and each time we didn't uh, the the only hotel that we had re- reserved was the uh, the first one, and then we just kind of made it up as we went along because unless it's crazy season or unless you're a control freak and you need to know where you're going to stay and everything along the way, you don't always have to have a hotel um, before you leave America um, or wherever you're leaving from. So yes, the the first thing is to buy the round trip ticket and then fill in the blanks uh, for hotels or uh, or transportation along the way. That's you know that's the way I do it. For some people, they can't do that because they need more security or um, you know they need more control. But um, if you try to wait until you have all the pieces done, then you probably aren't going to do it because um, that's just another excuse. Uh, you know procrastination. Is a, is a big, you know, as you, you were saying, you know, people say one of these days I want to do it, but they always find an excuse. It's the pets or the kids or the or the schedule or my money. It's like, okay, well, then don't do it, you know. Okay, one of the things that I have done in, in the past is I go and stay at a hotel that I find through the internet. No, basically my, my preferred way of traveling is Airbnb. But then once I'm in town, uh, I get to see places who are not internet savvy so they don't know how to advertise themselves to the internet but there are <laughs> nice places to stay you know and it's clean it's beautiful it's just that they just don't know how to advertise themselves on the internet <laughs> and that's why people don't find them and just because of that there's always room in those places yeah that was that's a perfect example you know the place that my girlfriend and I stayed in, in Belize we had a pool and we had a balcony and all this stuff. It was over the top for what we normally do. There's nothing wrong with it. But we were walking out one afternoon to get some uh, some ceviche, uh, some fresh ceviche. It was, a, it was a great day. And we walked past this cute little hotel. And I'm like, I would stay here. And she's like, I would stay here. I, we did. It's not even on the menu. It's not even on TripAdvisor or uh, Expedia or Orbitz or anything like that. And I, I went up and I, and I checked with them. And they don't even have a – they don't even have a um, – a website, you know, it's like, right. So it's like, <laughs> there's no way you would find that. But once you get on the ground, you can make stuff up as long as you're not there during, uh, you know, uh, peak season, but peak season is, uh, I've never, ever, ever had to sleep on a, a park bench or anything. Even during peak season, I always found a place to crash. Right. Okay, so Lex, along the way, so you've been in all these 80 countries and, and I don't know how many years you have been traveling, but along the way, you decided to write this book, Passport Forward. So can you tell us uh, more or less about the book? Uh, what was the idea behind it? Why you felt compelled to write it and the process of writing it? Yeah, that's a good question, man. So when I, was, when I left on my first big trip, my first, I mean, by the time I left on my first big trip in 2006, and I, a big trip meaning 16 months, 
uh, I had already been to, you know, 30 something countries. I forget whatever. So, uh, but I had always done all my countries or my visit, you know, my trips just kind of here and there. And so when I, when I picked up and took off before I left, my mom, who's no longer with me or no longer with any of us, she's gone. Um, she passed away three years ago. She's like, how am I going to know where you are? You know, what, what happens if you get in trouble? And I said, mom, I'm going to be fine. You know, it's like, I don't even know where I'm going to be tomorrow. Usually when I'm traveling, much less to, to be able to tell you, because mo- this was back before there were internet cafes everywhere. And, you know, some of these remote places of India and stuff or Cambodia, you're lucky to even get dial up back then. So I created a blog on my website. So the I, I, I was trying to figure out how I could do it and make a catchy name, but my name is Lex, L-E-X. So everything that I was trying to come up with kind of had, uh, the, it, it sounded like sex. And then one day I woke up and I, I so I named my, uh, my travels The Lexpedition. So I created a website called thelexpedition.com and uh, it's still active. And I, every time when I was traveling, every week or two weeks or three weeks or whatever time I could find an internet and enough time to sit down, I would post pictures and funny stories and make people laugh from some of my adventures. So people started uh, reading it and it started growing and growing and people kept, you know, telling me I was crazy and I was hilarious and, you know, all this other stuff. And they're like, you got to write a book. And I said, yeah, one of these days when I'm not busy, you know, climbing mountains and scuba diving or whatever. So, you know, people kept telling me, you know, you got to write a book, you got to write a book. I'm like, okay, one of these days. So one of these days started about, golly, uh, seven years ago, I said, okay, I'm going to start writing my book. And I started writing it, and and uh, I don't know if you've ever have you, have you written a book yet, Alain? I I have. I'm not. <laughs> I mean, still in the process of learning. So I have written books that are mostly like exercise to learn how to write a book. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's mostly putting together blog posts, and they are not all the time coherent. But yes, <laughs> uh, I, I'm I'm planning to. I'm I'm in the learning process. All right, so. The writing the book started, I don't know, 2012, 2000, I don't know when it was, but I started writing it and I would write chapters and chapters and chapters here and there. And then I would put it away and I was doing it all on a computer and I was storing it on, you know, whatever I was storing it on. And then I started getting more serious about it. And then I started making goals and I never finished it. And then I would put it away. And then finally I started, I'm like, okay, so the way that I, this is, this is a pretty cool story. I mentioned this on the, uh, the Jeff Goins podcast. Um, a couple uh, months ago when I was on his podcast. But the way that I uh, incentivized myself was I went on to Kickstarter and I started a campaign for my book called The Lexpedition. And I raised, uh, I don't know, I don't remember, $12,000 in like 30 days for uh, paperback and hardcover copies of my book all around the world. And I ended up saying, okay, now that I've sold this book in advance, I've got to write, I got to finish my book. So I um, I cranked and finished my book, and uh, I was up, you know, past midnight uh, or 2 a.m. on many nights trying to finish it. I got it finished, got it shipped right before Christmas a few years ago, and that was called the Lexpedition. And then people told me it was great and it was funny, and you know they could never do what I did. But then um, a, a bunch of my friends said, "Hey, this you gotta you gotta re- reformat this book. You know, the, the you know everyone's always got an idea, right? So." Uh, People like, hey, you got to reformat this book so it's not so much about you, but it's more about the reader. That was one suggestion. And then the other suggestion was you're mixing. This is a very important suggestion. What I was doing in that book, The Lexpedition, was I was mixing the why and the how. So the why is why would you want to, you know, go off on a great adventure or go after what you really want in life? And the how is, okay, how do you do it? You know, like we were talking about the funnel earlier or how do you save money? And you can't really mix the why and the how because people get uh, people want one or the other and they get distracted or they get lost. So what I ended up doing, I hired a a very talented professional editor and she and I went through it and uh, reformatted it. Uh, We moved things around. We I added a whole bunch of new chapters and I took out a bunch of the how chapters and I'm saving that for my next book. And uh, so then uh, a little bit over a year ago, Passport Forward came out and there, there's new stories in there. There's new adventures and uh, a lot of new chapters in there. So that was, uh, to answer your question, it, it's it's taken me eight years to write this book. And um, I'm actually getting ready to uh, do a couple different things on the Kindle version. 
and the audio book's coming out here shortly. I've got that 95% done. And, um, you know, so you were talking about the book that you've written or the, the books you've written and writing a book is one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in my life. And I, I use the analogy of it's like running a marathon. And just when I got done running the marathon and I got through the finish line and collapsed and uh, on the other end, someone picked me up and said, OK, congratulations, Lex, you ran that marathon of writing a book. Now you've got to write an, another, run another marathon called marketing and promoting. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm exhausted. So I've been running the other marathon now, marketing and promoting, doing uh, presentations and book signings and all kinds of stuff around the country. It's a, it's a long process. It's not over. <laughs> and uh, I've still got a couple more books in me when I sit down one day and do them. Okay. One of the most discouraging part about writing a book is um, uh, um, when you finish writing a chapter, you send it to your editor if someone is helping you, and they send it back with more red than black. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And I find that, uh, yeah, it, it makes my heart sink. <laughs> uh, but uh, you, uh, how do you learn how to write? Because, you know, a lot, many people would like to write a book, but that's, that's a skill that sometimes takes training. So you just sat down or was it your blog itself that taught you how to write paragraph or articles and then you integrated that into the book? Well, that's another very good question, buddy. Um, so the the way that I read a lot, so I, I've got, uh, you can't see my bookshelf behind me, but I've got a couple hundred books back here. A lot of them are travel or, or uh, philosophy or Zen or business or whatever, but I read a lot. And so by reading a lot, I kind of, uh, you know, you actually see what different styles work. So I'm not a great writer, but what I write is very simple. I don't use complicated words. I don't try to talk down to anybody. Uh, I use very... Um, People tell me that it's very authentic. So if you if you hung out with me, um, and hopefully one of these days we will, I get to hang out with you and you know buy you a beer or whatever, um, or a, a sandwich or whatever you're into, and we'll we'll hang out. And you, you would say that my book is exactly the way that I talk. And so the Lexpedition, the first version of my book, was very uh, direct and very um, very much like myself. And my editor, God love her, she was, she was like, I don't get this joke. I don't get this. And I'm like, well, uh, people do. Don't worry. And she's like, well, I don't think the general public is going to get it. So I took a lot of the – she had me take a lot of the, the jokes out or the, the, the references out. And I'm like, all right. So the, the Lexpedition book was much more like myself. The Passport Forward is much more – it's much cleaner, uh, politically correct. And, um, but the, 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 the suggestion that I would make for anybody that wants to write a book is just – start. And uh, um, I wouldn't send every chapter over to the editor because it's going to discourage you. So don't worry about getting anything other than just getting words on the paper and just write the way that you speak. And one of the things that I do occasionally is I'll grab my phone when I'm out walking in the park and I'll just do a, a voice recording of a story. So, you know, like, for example, when I was in Columbia in June uh, last year, it was, uh, by the way, Colombia is in the top five of my all-time favorite countries out of 82. If you haven't been to Colombia, go there before they starbuck it. And that's a good one, they starbuck it. Yeah, if they starbuck it, <laughs> I'm not so interested anymore. So, uh, and hopefully Starbucks doesn't sue me on this. But so, but what I'll do is I'll talk into the phone, and then I take the phone when I'm back in the office, and I put it up ne uh, next to my uh, my microphone. And I can, you know, Google, Google Gmail has a plugin that will uh, transcribe what they hear. There's uh, there's apps that will that you can. Uh, I, I can't think of it off the top of my head, but I used it before. But it'll basically you can upload it. Someone will transcribe it for pennies on the dollar, and um, then you at least have something on paper. So I would recommend if you don't like the type, or you're not a fast typer, or you don't think you're a good writer, if people tell you you're funny or you're interesting or you've got a great story. Take your phone, find an app, a voice recorder app, or um, gosh, maybe you can put this in the show notes when you. Uh, app. Well, I think all the smartphones have some kind of a voice recorder app. I, I, yeah, by this time, I haven't seen a phone without voice recording app. Oh, right, sure, but there's there's a specific app, and I can't think of it, but it will literally record it, upload it, and then they will tra they will transcribe it for you for pennies on the dollar. And is it rev dot com? What is it? Rev. That's it. Rev. Rev.com. Yeah. R-E-V. 
So yes. um, I've used that before and it's fantastic. So if you're, you know, if you're an aspiring writer and you've got a great story, whether it's a, a travel story or, you know, you've been through some crazy trauma in life or you've, you've dealt with grief from a, a dying family member or something and people tell you, hey, you got to write a book and you don't like the type or you don't want to do it, just, you know, use the phone and uh, do it that way. You know, just speak the way that people like you to speak. Don't try to be special. And, um, you know, people want, in my opinion, people want authenticity. They want to be entertained. They want to be inspired. You know, a lot of people aren't going to get on a plane and go to Romania or Croatia or Peru or Machu Picchu, but they live vicariously through those of us that do. So, you know, that's another whole thing. You know, I don't, I don't expect you to do what I do, but if you, if you think it's funny and entertaining and you say, one of these days I want to do that, then, Hey, I've served my purpose. How does one go through the process of using Kickstarter, I mean, uh, as a way to finance a book or a project? That's another good one. So for some uh, for some people, they're motivated. You got to figure out what your motivation is in life. For me, I like to uh, I'm motivated by helping people and being nice to people. Um, I'm not so much motivated by money or, or uh, you know, fame or fortune, but I like being nice to people. And I like not letting people down. So I don't like to let people down. So I use the Kickstarter as a uh, forced sense of accountability. So by promising people and taking their money that I was going to you know, deliver the book to them, I had to do it. So people supported me and I, and I got it done. So I used it as a, uh, as a deadline. And so if, if you wanted to do that, you know, if you, if you have a book idea – and you've got a pretty good following on Facebook or you've got lots of friends that love you uh, with the email addresses or in your text messages. And you can say, hey, I'm getting ready to, to launch my book. Uh, I'd like for you to, to support me. And you send them the link to your Kickstarter campaign. You can get it. You can do it that way. There, there's a whole science to it, but you don't have to know everything about Kickstarter. You know, you just have to know enough to get going. You know, I'm not an expert at Kickstarter, but I made twelve thousand dollars. You know, I, it wasn't all profit because I had to spend a lot of money on the book printing and stuff. But I made I made a uh, four or five thousand dollars cash after that twelve thousand dollars, and I got my book done. So just and wh what is it? People pay in advance for your book, or they just help you out and and expecting nothing in return? What exactly? How do they pay? How do people help you, and what do they get in return for helping you, or how much? help do they give you? Yeah. So, um, no one gave me help, uh, or money just, you know, cause they were a great person or whatever. So what I did was I created packages and I said, you can get a paperback for X amount. You can get a uh, hardcover, you know, color for X amount, or you can get bundles. You can get two of these or three of these or 10 of these. Um, so, you know, some people were buying 10 copies of my book so that they could a support me and then B share them with their, you know, their, their, their friends or other adventurers. And so no one just gave me, Hey, likes, I think you're great. Here's some cash. So I, I took that money and then I used it for, to finish my book, print the, print the versions, mail the versions, which were very expensive. You know, I mailed these all across the country and some across the world. So the, the, the there was not just a, Hey, you know, support me because I don't, I don't want, you know, charity. It was all, they, they bought my book in advance and um, that's all it was. And, you know, if you go, I don't have it in front of me, but if you, if you go to kickstarter.com and just type in Lex Litkovsky, my last name is spelled L A T K O V S K I. And the name of the book was the Lexpedition L E X P E D I T I O N. You'll find it and you'll see, you know, it was a kind of a choppy video. It was kind of funny. And uh, you'll see all the comments and all the people that back me and all the different things that I provided for different price levels. Okay, so your book, Passport, is, you just say that it's mostly about the why, why to travel. So if you had to give the biggest why, what, what would that be? Yeah, so good question. The, the why is not just uh, why you would want to travel around the world or, or be adventurous around the world. The why is why would you want to go after what you really want to go after before it's too late? You know, why would you settle for a life of, you know, regrets and routine, which a lot of people unfortunately settle for? Why would you want to settle for that when you can have what you really want? And 
you know, so why would you? So the whole the whole thing is not why would you travel around the world and go to 82 countries? Because not many people get to do that. Uh, I'm very blessed in that way. But why would why would you want to go after what you really want to go after? And so what I'm hoping to do, the why is what is it that you've been saying you wanted to do? but you've been putting off year after year after year, whether it's learning an instrument or learning how to dance, which I know you're a good dancer. You know, why would you not want to learn these things while you can? So the, the why is the why is important. You have to find your why um, or the why not. Once you find the why not, then you can kind of reverse engineer and get to the why. Right. Um, Lex, I think one of the biggest benefit of traveling is we get – of course, you know this. You we get to know all the different cultures that there are in the world, and I think if people get to experience different cultures, there will be more peace in the world. I mean, there is animosity against Muslims or other ethnic groups, mostly because we don't know them. You know, they just look different or speak differently or whatever. At one time, there was an animosity towards Colombia because of the war on drugs. So I felt like a little bit of a victim in that situation but yeah I, I you promote traveling for f for the sake of exploration but i think traveling for the sake of knowing human being to human being and getting exposed to the culture and at the end of the day we are all the same you know we just have different background and different cuisine or, or whatever due to the regionality of our birthplace but we are all the same we have the same feeling we have all the same love for our family we want the best for people around us and it's only through traveling that we explore that and i think there will be less war and less hardship and more generosity if we get to you know explore the world a little bit more no, that's exactly true i mean uh you know i'm not i'm not uh suggesting i mean you're from colombia is that right elaine right yeah so you and i are you and I, you know, you, you speak fluent French. You're up in Montreal and you speak fluent Spanish. Uh, I, speak, I speak fluent Spanish. I, I just messed up my English there, but I speak fluent Spanish. And I, I spent three months in Indonesia, which is the largest Muslim country in the world. And I never one time had anything happen to me where I thought anything about the people uh, as far as their religion. They were they, they treated me the same way that, that they treat me in any other country for the most part. And uh, it doesn't matter. There are bad people around the world and there are good people around the world. It doesn't matter. I mean, I can walk out my door here from my nice office and go into the wrong part of town and, uh, you know, get in trouble. You know, I, I always say that as long as you're not looking for hookers or drugs, you can avoid 95 percent of the trouble when you're traveling. The moment you go and start looking for what you're not supposed to look for, you get in trouble. But if you're not looking for that, you're going to be OK, because all around the world, whether you're in China or in a big city or, you know, in a rural, rural, rural village in Colombia, people only want three things. They want family and friends that they can share a coffee with or share a meal with. They want a roof over their head, whatever that looks like. Sometimes it's just a tarp or, and, and then, and then they want, you know, a food to eat. They want to have, they don't want to be starving. Those three simple basic factors are, are universal. People are generally good people that I've met around the world. They want to be around other people and their family. They want to have uh, you know, enough food on their table, and they want to have a place to call home or at least a place to put their head down. And outside of that, it doesn't matter what color you are, what religion you are. Uh, for the most part, that's a universal uh, law that I've seen in all 82 countries I've been to. Okay, so Lex, I, I have no more questions for you. Can you, uh, first of all, let me know if there is anything that I neglected to ask you. And if not, then can you give us more information about your website, your book, where can people get it? And if you offer any service or products in addition to your book? Yes, uh, because I saw your website. It looks very nice. And uh, yeah, uh, let us know what's in there. Well, thank you. Um, and I apologize because I don't speak. Uh, fluent French, and, and your name is, uh, I know it's Alain, Alain, how do you pronounce it again? Well, it depends on who pronounces it, so uh, <laughs> uh, Alain is good. Alain, yeah, it's it's not, yes. it's hard, it's even harder for me to say that, so I apologize. Um, I'll just call you Hermano, how's that? Muy bien, muy bien, gracias. Entendido. Okay, so the the one thing that I would like to, you know, you, you asked a lot of great questions, buddy. The, uh, the one thing that I will 
would, would like to leave people with is it doesn't matter what you want to do or where you want to go or what you want to learn or whether it's playing, you know, playing golf more or whatever, just do it. People have, there's no, you're not waiting for an ex- permission to do things. Don't wait for permission. Don't wait for the right time. There's a, a chapter in my book that I say, there's never a perfect time to leave. And I talk about traveling around the world, but I also talk about there's never a perfect time to, you know, fill in the blank. You know, I want to learn tango dancing. All right, do it. Well, you know, it's like people, people have excuses, but once you, you tell them, all right, well, just do it, you know, and, and what's, what's, what's your excuse and, and find out what the excuse is and then do it anyway. So there's, there's never a perfect time to do anything, but just do it. And then uh, the other thing is you have to figure out what's the worst that can happen. People always have these fears. It's like, what's the worst that can happen? You know, of course, no one wants to die or be hurt, but you know, generally the fears are, are, are imaginary. And, uh, What's the worst that can happen? Figure out what the worst that can what is the worst that can happen, and do and then do it anyway. So, uh, to answer your question, uh, as far as uh, how to reach me, you can email me. The you can email me two different ways: lexlitkovsky at gmail dot com. Excuse me, I'm getting over a cold, and my last name is spelled L A T K O V S K I. Lexlitkovsky at gmail dot com or lex at litkovsky. Dot com. I've had that one since I was, uh, that's been like a 25 year old email address. So, uh, Lex at Lekovsky.com, Lex Lekovsky at gmail.com. And my website is either just go to passportforward.com. And as far as what I provide, I, I, uh, I speak, uh, I make presentations in front of audiences. I did one a couple months ago for 275 people in Franklin, Tennessee. Um, I do book signings. I also help people with, uh, coming up with ideas for, how to go after what they want in life, I, you know. So that's private coaching, but just email me and I can, I can help you. And, and generally, as long as you're willing to do something and you really want to do it, I'll help you. Um, if you're going to come to me and say, hey, one of these days I want to, you know, learn how to do this, but I'm not really interested in doing it, I'm like, all right. So let me know when you're ready and I'll help you. Have you ever thought of uh, organizing trips to? Um to a destination, let's say this year we're going to go to, I don't know, Costa Rica and organize, I don't know, 10, 20 people and go together for a couple of weeks to Costa Rica. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's great because uh, the, the, there's like, there, I'm, I'm going to get sidetracked for a second. There's only 50 countries in Europe or there are 50 countries in Europe and I've been to 42 of them. Eight of them I haven't been to yet. And so what I would love to do, like one of them is Moldova. And I don't know how many people have been to Moldova except for the people that live in Moldova. But I'm like, hey, why don't you go with me to Moldova? I've never been there, but we're going to make this up as we go along. And I'm not going to take a whole bunch of people because then I can't uh, be nice to everybody at the same time. But I would take a handful of people, five, six people, and we'll go to Moldova or we'll go to Belarus or we'll go, um, you know, I'll take you to, to Central or South America. The, the one thing that I would do is I would go back to Laos. Uh, or Lao, depending upon how you pronounce it. And uh, we would ride motorcycles for a couple of weeks. Uh, I rented a 250cc dirt bike that was in my book. It's called Dirty Harry. And I would take you on a, an adventure from from point A to point B, and we're just going to make it up as we go along. But you have to promise me that you're not going to complain and you're not going to say, hey, this hotel is not a five-star hotel. And um, if you get hurt because you're an idiot and you rode off of a uh, <laughs> off of into the ditch it's not my fault but uh i i shouldn't say idiot but you know say hey, you guys are responsible adults let's go have some fun don't blame me if things aren't exactly the way you wanted them but that's what adventure travels for so those are the types of things i would love to do i would love to take a a group of of, of fun motorcycle guys or girls across the uh the the, the beautiful country of Laos. And uh, I've got a buddy up in Canada who uh, I met when I was in Cambodia. He's already said he would do it. I got a buddy in Kentucky who said he would do it. You know, it wouldn't be cheap, but uh, I'm not going to make much money, but I'd be able to share my adventure and my passion with you if you're interested. Uh, well, uh, you know, I live a digital life nowadays, so uh, you can put my name on it. And, and I have a personal question. How do you find a girlfriend who is willing to do all that traveling with you? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky because... Uh, uh, well, first of all, I try to be a nice guy, and I'm um, I'm honest, and and uh, I'm fun to be around. And if you ask me, 
<laughs> but my girlfriend, um, I finally found one. Her name's Meg. She's super sweet. I've uh, been with her for six years. She, uh, you know, she has her own money, so she doesn't need my money. Um, she loves to travel. She's adventurous. She likes going camping. She's fun. She's funny. And uh, she doesn't need to stay in the three and five star hotels. You know, we do it occasionally, but I don't know. Um, I guess you put a classify on Craigslist <laughs> for a girlfriend who likes to go. Well, you can do that. I mean, I I did do Match.com after I got divorced, and I'm and I did have some good relationships there. But I did have to when I went to travel around the world a couple times. I did have to say goodbye to to significant relationships because my my my. My interest was to go see the world and not to settle down. And so that cost me, you know, those relationships. But uh, with with my girlfriend now, Meg, it's a different story. So um, we're both on the same wavelength. But there's nothing wrong with classifieds or match.com. You know, I had to kiss. I had to kiss a lot of uh, I'm not going to say frogs because all the girls were cute or women were cute and sweet. But, um, you know, uh, the way that I found Meg was through. Uh, One of my all-time best friends, she and her husband hooked us up. So, you know, I'm one of these blind date or suggested dates, which never seems to work, but this one works. So, Congratulations. <laughs> okay, Lex, I'm not going to hold you any longer. It's been about an hour, so thank you so much for your... Well, muchas gracias, and I know you're heading down to Colombia here shortly, and uh, I'm, I'm happy for you, and I'm jealous. It's one of my all-time favorite countries, and um, I really appreciate your time, and You asked some amazing questions, and I hope your readers or your listeners understood it uh, and appreciated it. And uh, all I got to say is life should be an amazing adventure. Begin well and do not fear the end. And that's it. Thank you, Lex, for coming over and spending this time with us. Now, it seems a little bit ironic to me that I am publishing this episode at a time where people are not traveling anymore. I mean, it's very unfortunate. I have this um, conversation pre-recorded and this is the time that it just hap I just happened to publish it. And how could I ever imagine that there would be a time in our life in which all, all frontiers would be closed, where people would not be able to travel from one country to the other one. So here, I, here we are, Lex and I, talking about our travelings, talking about going to this country and, and the other one, when in fact no one can travel for the reasons of tourism at this moment in history. There was a survey done a few days ago where 66% of North Americans say that they are not interested in traveling. And it is quite normal. I mean, we have been going through a lot. This epidemic has changed in many ways the way that we think, the way that we act, and the way that we see things coming from other countries. So uh, let me ask you before I leave, uh, will this change your traveling um, plans uh, For example, I travel every January. January is when it's so cold here in Canada, in Montreal, that I feel that that's my escape time, the time. I don't want to leave Montreal when it's warm and sunny and this, during the summer. I want to leave when it's cold, when there's nothing else going on. Anyway, my question to you is, would you be interested in traveling sometime in the future and i cannot i can't understand if you are not but just answer the question you can reach me through facebook instagram twitter or facebook and that's it talk to you next week goodbye